Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin. Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecma'in. Today is Friday, October 21st. Continuing on the class on Maharam al-Lisan. And we're going to read over some lines. Uh, inshallah today. So Bismillah, now we're going to move on to it is recommended uh, to mention concealed information about miracles and good character of people. It is recommended to mention concealed information about miracles and good character of people. So um, Concealing the secrets of a person once they have died could be per permissible and it can also be recommended to match, to, to mention. So generally what the scholars say is that if a person dies and after their death there were wonderful things about them, you can mention it once they're gone because one is safe that, alhamdulillah, they didn't turn on their religion and they continued on the path. So that's something that could be good and that's why we have stories of the righteous after they die. There's a lot of stories about them. Um, concealed information could also be things like if they owed somebody money, then that could be mentioned, just that he had some debts. In case some people want to cover that, that could be allowed. Uh, and also good character people can also be mentioned. Uh, there's no real harm in that. He said, likewise, it is prohibited to be happy about the calamities that befall a believer. It is prohibited to be happy about a calamity or tribulation that falls upon a believer. It is uh, so. This is obviously um, showing happiness for someone because they're your enemy and uh, you're happy about that. This is not allowed. Um, there's a hadith that mentions: Do not show happiness for the calamity of your brother, and then have Allah have mercy on him and give you tribulation. So if a believer has a tribulation, feel sorry for him, make dua for him, never be happy and joyous because they have some tribulation. It's really a bad sign. Tribulation, like for example, a person may have bought a new car and then they crashed it and you're happy about it, but they lost it. A person gets a disease and you're happy about it. Any type of calamity or difficulty that falls upon a believer and then you rejoice in it, that would be prohibited. Likewise, it is prohibited to wish for death because of a tribulation. We spoke about this a few weeks ago. Wishing for death is generally not allowed. In some cases, it's allowed. That is when you actually ask Allah for death. It's a hadith that mentions none of you should wish for death because of a tribulation that befalls him. If he must do so, he should say the following. O oh Allah, give me long life as long as it is good for me and give me death if that is better for me. So if a person has a really difficult in the end of his life and if they must say something then they could say something like give me longer life if it's good for me and give me death if that's what's better for me. One of the great scholars Imam Nawawi he says that this is if a person wishes for death because of a tribulation or the like. If he desires death out of fear for his religion, because of the corruptness of the time and the like, then it is not disliked. So this means that if a person wishes for death only because they fear that their faith is might get taken away from them, there's a lot of tough trials and tests in the time that they live in, there's a lot of hardships and difficulty, and because of the fear that they have concerning their religion, were they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that, then that would not be disliked because that fear is legitimate fear. One of the other scholars, he said, only three people desire death, a person who is unaware of what 
comes after death, one who is running away from the decree of Allah, and one who is desirous of meeting Allah. Three cases of how people wish for death. I don't know if you know of a story in the Quran about Maryam uh, when she became pregnant with Sayyidina Isa, she retreated away from the people. There's conversation in the Quran how she wished that she had died. So in that the scholars analyze why would Maryam would say that if it's not permissible to want death or to ask for death. Again we said that it is generally not allowed to ask for death. In certain situations it is permissible. Right? And the interpretation scholars give for Maryam wishing is that one, she feared that people have bad thoughts about her religion as a result. They would fault her, they would say things about her, then it would be a tribulation for Maryam. The second reason is that her people would fall into slander and lies about her because of her and claiming that she fornicated and then that would destroy them because Allah would destroy them. So this is why her wishing for death was permissible. Obviously Allah didn't give her that. Um, Allah continued to give her strength, give her a great child and her child becomes the Messiah, the great Prophet of Allah. And Maryam has a chapter mentioned after her in the Quran. She is the greatest woman of all time and during her time, based on the difference of opinion between the scholars. Uh, she's an incredible, pious uh, individual uh, who's a great leader to both men and women. So that's what happened by her being alive and maintaining her life. So you can say in a jest, is it allowed to wish for death? Normally, no. When is it allowed? When someone has fear that they may lose their religion, that things have become very difficult, and they're afraid that they may fail in that test of their faith, maybe go into kufr, only in that case would it be allowed. You say you have a question? Okay. Um, Please so, don't make noises, guys, with your pens or anything. Um, so, uh, when, like, letting my constitution, uh, she didn't want to go back because um, she... Uh, you don't want like people to think how like she felt with you. Right. Yes, well, this is during the time that she was pregnant with Isa they said, before she had the baby. After she had the baby, uh, the blessed Prophet Isa salam, when he was born, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told her to go back to the people but not to say anything. And they had a fast during that time from the and the people, the believers of that time had a fast where they would not talk. So she fasted where she could not talk except point to the baby. And when people, when she went back to the town, people started to say things and then all she did is point to him. It was a little tiny baby. She pointed to him. They looked at him. They said, like, why are you pointing to your baby? And the baby turned around and actually started speaking. He said, Qala inni Abdullah. He said, I'm the messenger of God. I'm the servant of God. He's given me the book and the wisdom and made me a prophet. Peace be upon me the day that I'm born, the day that I die, and the day that I come back. And different conversation that takes place. People saw that, they said, oh my God, this is not a normal case. This is an incredible, miraculous story. Anyway, going back to the point, the point is wishing for death. In general, one should not wish for death except it is allowed only in those cases. The next line, next topic, uh, every line he, he switches topic. So he ended with that and then he said, mizahi, Too much joking is also prohibited. Since it usually uh, causes problems or difficulties. Okay, Too much joking. When was joking allowed? Is joking allowed in general? To, to first ask this question. Joking that leads to harm, that uh, one lies about, because often when people joke a lot, they lie a lot. Those are not permissible to do. But if you tell the truth when you joke, and it's light joking, you don't do it all the time as a habit, then it is not only allowed, but it's actually recommended, depending on the situation, right? The Prophet said, a few times he said a joke, and people asked him, do you tell jokes, you know, Messenger of God? He said, I tell jokes, but I tell the truth. I don't lie in my jokes. Because it's never allowed to lie. Especially also with jokes, you cannot lie. Um, too much laughing 
too much joking leads to the heart not being soft to the religion. It just becomes everything fun and play. Just laugh all the time, ha ha ha. Just nothing, nothing is serious for you. So if a person is always joking, always laughing, then you want to talk about the Day of Judgment and the Hereafter and Hellfire and stuff, they really got to come out of their normal way to actually become serious enough. So the scholars, they prohibit as a habit to joke around all the time. Not only that, but also if you joke about people and you say things about them and you do that as a habit, most likely you're going to say things that are hurt their feelings. I, I know you've all been around somebody that jokes about people. Hey, you're like this. Hey, you did that. As a habit, maybe if they say things about you one day or two days, but one day if they do it a lot, they're going to hurt your feelings. Eventually, they'll probably say something. You guys all know, right? You've had people in your life, they joke around a little bit, but then they say something that's very mean. It happens when you joke too much. At first, it's like, hey, you walk so funny. Or, hey, you know, you eat funny. And then one day, it's like, hey, you look funny. They might say some things about you that upset you, and then it hurts your feelings. Why is that a big issue? Who cares if your feelings are hurt? Uh, Islam doesn't allow someone to tell you something that hurts your feelings. It's not allowed to hurt someone's feelings. So for that reason, do not harm others. There's also pranks that people pray where they play, where they take the belongings of the person. So you take something from someone, you hide it. You hide their purse, you hide their wallet, you hide their phone. This happens a lot. Those kind of things are all prohibited, not allowed to do. He says, uh, Hadith states, none of you should take the belongings of his brother or sister in the deen, uh, is understood as sister as well, in jest or, and seriously. Don't take it as a play. Don't, don't take anybody's anything for joke or nothing. Because the person takes the belongings with the intention of returning it. He said seriously because it causes the person to have fear that he lost his belonging. So if someone takes your phone or your purse or your computer or whatever, for that moment, you get scared. You feel like you lost it. That's a, that's a horrible feeling to have. Allah didn't allow and didn't want that a person has that feeling. I lost my phone and you get all sad and you get worried. That's not allowed to harm, cause harm to somebody. That is causing harm to somebody. That is scaring them. That is frightening them. So that is also not allowed. So I'll give you a couple minutes to take those notes down, please, because it's very important. The first one is that jokes have to be truthful. They cannot be all the time as a habit. They, uh, it's recommended to joke here and there. It lightens the mood. It kind of keeps people happy. Prophet Sallallahu was not serious all the time to where he never smiled or never joked. There was time he smiles. Actually, he smiled when he was with people all the time. And when he... Uh, he was by himself. He didn't. He was more very serious, actually. And when he was around people, here and there, he used to make a joke to keep things light for people, so they can enjoy life a little and move on, right? So it's to teach people. Everything that the Prophet ﷺ did was only to teach us. So every action that he did is to teach us manners and behavior. So if he joked here and there, it meant we can also joke here and there. You know, because that's part of life. You don't want to be around somebody serious all the time. This guy came to me after Friday prayer today, and he tells me, you're always so serious when you give the Friday prayer, but afterwards you, you're you always smiling and happy. I said, well, there's a time for everything. You know, can't go up there and the khutbah and give jokes. It's not the place for jokes. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, used to give khutbah, he used to be very serious in the khutbah. You know, it's reminding people of their jobs and responsibility. Joking also loses a sense of dignity, like where you don't respect the person as much. So if a person jokes all the time, they're not very well respected. If a person is generally more serious, they'll be more respected. So a little bit is what? Recommended. A little bit is recommended. I'll give you a couple minutes to take some notes on that let me know if anybody needs a recap or anything repeated we are recording as I'm speaking so you can watch this class later if you choose as well inshallah I should have it up by tomorrow morning so bismillah continuing on 
وكتم فضل الله علما أو غنا كليس عندنا وليس معنا it is prohibited to conceal the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether it is knowledge or wealth not allowed to conceal it this would be like saying if somebody asks you do you have any money they said no no we don't have anything um, there's nothing with us so to lie about wealth and knowledge uh, to conceal it is prohibited such that if someone were to ask you um, do you have money you say no and you pretend to be very poor so you see a person walking around he's like life is just horrible for me you know, I have no money I have nothing you, know, like, you feel bad for them and then they leave the Friday prayer or the mosque or whatever you see them get in an expensive car with an expensive phone you're like I thought you didn't have anything right I saw somebody today complaining to me that he doesn't have much and he didn't complain but he's just talking about uh, the vibe was that he didn't have much and then I saw him drive off like in a Mercedes SUV you know so what are you complaining about so if you have wealth don't lie about it um, reason why is also because Allah wants you to when he blesses you with something there's a hadith says if Allah blesses someone he loves to see the traces of his blessings on him so meaning if you you have wealth it doesn't hurt to wear something nice that indicates you have some money right so if you have a lot of wealth and then you're wearing like trashy clothes wearing t-shirts that are torn jeans that are like dirty you look like somebody on the street might actually offer you money because they think you're homeless right then you're like no 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 i have a lot of money it doesn't look like it so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants traces not like full out wear a thousand dollar clothes no but some things that indicate Allah has given you blessings, right? So you see nice people who have a lot of money, they wear nice shoes, right? Or they wear an expensive watch, or they'll wear something that kind of shows they're well off. You can tell, right? So often they say you look at somebody's shoes or you look at their clothes, if it's an expensive line, it just means they probably have wealth. Nobody just dresses in an expensive suit and nice shoes and just, no, that's all I have. I don't have anything else. It's not the case. Okay, so how would this relate to you guys? Well, as you get older, just don't be the miser to the extent that you just dress as messed up as you can, look poor, look dirty, and then just say, Alhamdulillah, I don't want the world. Well, it's not, you know, if you look like that anyway, people might offer you money and help. If that happens, that means you're not taking care of yourself. Or wealth. Uh, excuse me, or uh, knowledge. If you have knowledge, don't hide it. Don't conceal it. Somebody were to ask you a question and you know it, answer it. You know, if, if you go in a place and somebody's like, I have no idea how to make wudu, and you just don't want to show you know anything. So you're like, do you know how to make wudu? I don't know anything. That's a lie. That's a lie. You do know. You can share with them what you know. Okay? That doesn't mean you answer legal questions and verdicts, but it means if you know something for sure, don't hide it. Right? Help them out and help them with that. Remember the verse of the Quran is very beautiful. As for the blessings of your Lord, make mention of it. Proclaim it. Thank Allah when He's giving you things. Right? Alhamdulillah, I got a new job. They give me good money. Alhamdulillah. Thank Allah. Allah loves to see that you thank Him for His blessings. Alhamdulillah, I got an award at my school. MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah. Right? Alhamdulillah, my parents gifted me a new car. It's amazing. Alhamdulillah. No problem. No problem. The only time you should be careful of saying that and using that is when you think that by mentioning it to people a specific big blessing when people might give you the evil eye or something like that then it's better not to necessarily mention everything okay i'm not sure exactly where to draw the line but you know be careful of a, of a blessing that is very unique such that people may give you the evil eye and as we know as muslims evil eye is true prophet said 
al aynu haq right the eye the evil eye is true it happens it's what you guys you kids growing up would call jinxing someone right you know somebody they praise you and they say knock on wood obviously that's haram for us we wouldn't knock on wood but we would say say mashallah not knock on wood switch it say mashallah alhamdulillah right hey i never ever failed in my in a, in a test alhamdulillah don't say knock on wood i've seen muslims they're like knock on wood then they look for wood to knock on what does that do right just say mashallah acknowledge allah's gift upon you any questions so far I'm explaining in a way you can all understand, right? Okay, alhamdulillah. So don't hide knowledge and wealth if you have it. Um, you don't also have to go tell somebody exactly how much you have either. It's not what it's saying. So you have wealth? Yeah, alhamdulillah. I have $27,580 in my account. You don't have to tell anybody that, right? I'm just making that up. I don't have 27000 in my account. But you can say that. I mean you shouldn't say that you don't need to say that next one is a different topic it said it is prohibited to ruin the character of a wife with her husband so this is when somebody says something or does something to ruin the character and relationship of a wife with her husband so there's a hadith that mentions that the devil, he established his throne wherever he wants to lead, out in the middle of the ocean. Iblis, shaitan. And he has all these jinn that work for him. Every night, they go and they report to Iblis what they did. May Allah curse him. And somebody said, I did this bad thing. And another jinn says, I did that bad thing. He said, that's nothing. And a jinn comes and says that I made... Uh, I did not leave such a person until I separated them from their wife. Meaning that he did, he, he instigated a fight between a couple until the husband and wife are very angry. They don't sleep next to each other or nothing. They, they, they move away from each other and they're angry at each other in the night. They go to sleep and they both hate each other, angry at each other. And the jinn that says that to Iblis, Iblis tells him, you come sit next to me, you have done really good. So any Muslim couple should know that no matter what differences they have, they should never be angry with one another because if they do, then shaitan wins. And they should never be angry with one another, or hate one another. They have to, every single night when they go to sleep, be at peace with one another and not fight. Right? So, aside from that, a lot of times when people bring harm to relationships, relationships break down and then people break up. They get a divorce. And divorce, although it is halal, it is allowed to get a divorce in Islam. Not like for Catholics, they cannot get a divorce. When they get married, it's like for sickness and in health forever and ever and ever, basically. As Muslims, we would say a divorce, la qadrullah, is allowed. However, it is the worst of those things allowed. Meaning, you should never try to do it unless there's no choice whatsoever. Then it would be allowed to get a divorce. So if I were to ask you, is it allowed as a Muslim to get divorced? Yes, but really not like to do that. Very dislike. It's looked at as a last option. And divorce causes people to cut off ties. Um, that Allah has ordered them to maintain. You guys know when I say cutting off ties, it means relationship with family members. Sometimes, say cousins get married, and then they break up and get a divorce. Then the brother and mother, who are the, maybe the, the mother of the daughter and the father of the son, it's allowed in Islam for cousins to get married. Then they would no longer speak to one another because their kids got divorced. And then it would ruin their relationships. And no longer do they speak with one another. No longer do they visit one another and then Allah has commanded that brothers and sisters always keep connection with one another always speak with one another and it's haram to cut somebody off to when you're not talking to them anymore so were you to ask you know do you speak to your brother or sister and you say 
Ah, uh, no, no, no. I don't talk to my brother. I don't talk to my sister. You know, that's haram. You have to. You have to speak to your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your cousin, your uncles, your aunts, your grandparents, your great uncles, everyone. This is one of the biggest things as a Muslim you have to do in your life. If you cut off your relationship with your relatives, Allah will cut you off from His mercy. You know that. It's a hadith that Allah Ta'ala told the womb, which is the, 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 the birthplace of a mother, in her womb, in her, in her stomach where a child grows, that womb has a special relationship with Allah. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala says, anyone that cuts each other's relationship with one another, the relationships I mentioned to you guys, mothers, fathers, cousins, uncles, etc. Anyone who cuts one another off and says, I never want to talk to that person, then Allah cuts them off from His mercy. On the Day of Judgment, they will not get any mercy. Doesn't matter what the reasons are. Doesn't matter what the reasons are. You know, he took money from me, he took land from me, he did this, he did that, she did that. Doesn't matter. The fact that you've cut them off and you don't talk to them at all is a major sin. Very serious sin. So what? that's what, when you tamper with relationships, you make people get a divorce. They get a divorce, they cut off kinship ties or other ties. You also break up what Allah has put love and mercy and you're also destroying a house that was built on Islam. Basically a house that worshipped Allah. You, you know, the people in the house were worshipping Allah. They had a nice functioning family. Children who were like loving God. A good family that was happy. And, uh, you know, divorce is never ever good. Children that their both parents are together often are more successful. However, once in a while, divorce does happen. It's not the end of the world. You move on with your life. You try to be the best person you can be, and you pray for your parents. Just because you get a divorce or the parents get a divorce, you cannot prefer one parent over another. You have to give them their rights. A lot of times when parents break up one of the children, the children will keep one of them or they don't have the same relationship. Either they'll grow up and not talk to the father or the mother, and that's prohibited. Both mother and father, even in divorce, must be treated equally and well by the child. It's not at their business that their parents got a divorce. It's sad. It's horrible. However, the relationship between the person and the parents must remain strong, powerful, and connected. The next section, one more section we'll do, and inshallah we'll give you a break. We don't want to do too many every week because then it'll be too much. So we'll do a little bit. Then I'm going to give you a break where I want you to ponder your notes. Then we'll have a group discussion together about what we studied. Okay? So the last section we'll cover here today. It is prohibited to study Islamic law or fiqh or spirituality of Islam called tasawwuf in order to gain wealth or position amongst people. This is not allowed to do so. So anyone who studies Islamic law or spirituality just to gain wealth, not for the sake of Allah. So they can just have a job. They don't really, they don't learn in order to get closer to Allah or to please Allah or to earn His pleasure. They learn only to get money and they do it for worldly reason. It is prohibited to do that as a result. Knowledge must be sought for the sake of Allah. Seeking knowledge not for the sake of Allah is prohibited. So, inshallah we'll stop here. Um, there's some discussion of the early scholars. They really wanted that you seek knowledge only for the sake of Allah, not even for a job. The later ulama, because of the need and, and the situations that arose, they did allow people to seek knowledge in order to benefit the ummah, and thereby if they earn a living from it, that there is no harm in it, right? As long as they did it for the sake of Allah, and then the living standard is part of life that you must survive. Some ulama didn't like that, some ulama liked, allowed it, so there's a, there is an allowance of that. Why you have today imams that are paid and scholars or sheikhs that teach at college universities or Islamic institutions and then they take a salary and a stipend because somehow you have to earn a living so that is allowed 
But if a person went and sought that knowledge only because they just want to do it for a job and they don't really care to get closer to Allah, they don't pray, they don't do anything, that will be a source of loss for them on the Day of Judgment, will be a source of their punishment, a'udhu billah, and they will not be rewarded. Rather, the knowledge will be against them on the Day of Judgment. So that's why we seek refuge in Allah from knowledge that has no benefit. Knowledge that has no benefit. There's a dua of the Prophet Sallallahu He says, I seek refuge in you from knowledge that doesn't benefit. So learning anything that you don't practice and implement in your life, there's no good in it. Knowledge is only a tool in order to make you more aware of Allah, more practicing of your faith, more connected to your faith that results in your closeness to Allah. And when we say closeness to Allah, we're obviously meaning your level of dedication to the faith. The more practicing you are as a Muslim, the more knowledge you have, the closer you are to Allah. We're not talking about closer like physical distance. Allah is not in a place. So there's no getting closer and further from Allah physically. But there is getting further away from Allah, meaning the commands and rules of Allah. And then there's getting close to Allah by obeying His orders and His commandments. Right? So a person who prays five times a day, who fasts and does the pillars and inwardly and outwardly brings themselves to act according to Islamic law, then they are very close to Allah. Right? They're very close to Allah. And the greatest person, the greatest of all of Allah's creation, who is the closest to God, is the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. So inshallah we'll stop there, take a break, and we'll have group discussions. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد